All right, so remember this class, we're, we're talking about man, sin, and salvation. It's obviously our first you know, couple weeks need to be dealing with the doctrine of man. What I decided to do today is kind of do a, uh, a jet tour survey of the doctrine of man. To summarize, perhaps in, I don't know how long it'll take me, a half hour, 45 minutes or whatever, to kind of summarize the whole doctrine of man in a short period of time. It's a, uh, like it's a jet tour, it's a, you know, the helicopter above the forest looking down sort of thing. Uh, doesn't cover all the details, but uh, sometimes I think it can be helpful to look at things broadly before you, before you get into the details. Obviously, details in the big picture should work in harmony with each other. The big picture should be based on the details, and then the details should line up with the big picture story. You know, God is a God of order, so what he reveals connects with everything else. So I would liken what we're going to do here to, you know, if you have, let's just say you have a, 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 a long movie that you're watching on your, on your machine and you, you fast forward it at three or four times the speed, you're obviously not going to catch much dialogue, but you're going you're gonna to see where the movie's going, where the scenery is. And, you know, if you go through it really fast, you don't feel like you grasped it all, but you kind of feel like you got the big picture kind of like where the movie's going. That's kind of like what we're doing here. We're kind of getting the, rem the remote control and doing a zip tour. But I think, I think it'll be helpful uh, because the doctrine of man is something that you find from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. It's also something, remember God is instituting a kingdom plan throughout history that makes sense and also perfectly intersects with all the other major doctrines. So one of the things we want to do with a, the with a theology class like this is to connect the dots. I mean, we should be able to know how the doctrine of man fits with the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of salvation and the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of eschatology. And, you know, there's all, all the doctrines end up uh, inter interrelating uh, with each other. So... So let's begin here. I've, uh, I've, I've identified uh, 10 steps here. Uh, again, not every detail is covered. Somebody might say, well, why didn't you add this or this or that? You might even have a good point. Uh, but I think when you look at these uh, 10, 10 points or 10 steps, you can get a, a pretty good picture of where uh, the doctrine of man or why the doctrine of man is so uh, significant. And so uh, the first point uh, is going to be closely tied with Genesis 1. And again, I'm a real big believer in uh, knowing Genesis 1 and 2 really well and understanding Revelation 20 to 22 really well because you know Genesis 1 to 2 is the once upon a time and Revelation 20 to 22 is they lived happily ever after. And then the rest of the Bible is connecting the dots of how we go from one, you know, the, the bliss in the Garden of Eden to the fall to the restoration of all things. So uh, you, can't, you can't overemphasize the importance of the Genesis 1, 26 to 28 for the doctrine of man. Part of the reason why I say that is it's obviously significant when you read it because you're talking about the image of God. You're seeing what man is tasked to do. But you're going to see this in, in, inner passage connections intertextual connections. When you get to Psalm 8, you'll see Psalm 8 verses 4 to 8 is basically a commentary on Genesis 1, to 28. You're going to find other references in the New Testament to Psalm 8, which is a commentary on Genesis 1. Uh, and so there's this theme of man's responsibility in regard to the world. Uh, now, on this first point here, when we mentioned the kingdom mandate, uh, this, the, and, and by the way, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that the kingdom is the, is the primary theme of Scripture. I think, I think all the other major doctrines can be subsumed under that. Um, and obviously all major themes are going are, are to harmonize when properly understood. But I, I, I do believe that the kingdom uh, is, the, is the primary theme of Scripture. I get more into the whys of that perhaps in Theology 4. 
but you should know that. Um, when it comes to the kingdom mandate, under the federal headship of Adam, and again, a federal head refers to somebody who is representing a people group. So there's federal headship in your family, usually with the father. There's federal headship with countries. We have presidents and leaders that make decisions on behalf of all, all of us. There's federal headship in regard to man. So under the federal headship of Adam, man is created as king and son, which I think is at the essence of what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. Um, man is created as king and son. Again, that's a small k king. God is capital K. But uh, when being created in the image of God means that man is a representative and a vice regent to do God's bidding upon the earth. So there, from the very beginning, there's kingly applications in regard to mankind. So under the federal headship of Adam, man is created as king and son to fill, rule, and subdue the earth for God's glory, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. He is also created to be in three relationships with God, other people, and creation. So when you look at Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule. And that word for rule, Radah is used later on in the Old Testament for kings that rule. It's used of the Messiah's rule in Psalm 110. So let, let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So man is made in the image of God and his task is to, is to rule. It's to rule and subdue the earth. Now that word for subdue, is a very strong term, very uh, much in the sense of controlling and dominating and making things how they're supposed to be. Verse 27 says, God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then you see another task that they're supposed to do. According to verse 28, uh, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So there needs to be procreation and the filling of the earth. Notice and he brings up again, and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So like I said, all, all scripture is equally inspired. Um, this passage though in particular really gives you the, uh, I would call it the charter for mankind. Uh, I would call it the kingdom mandate. Some have called it the cultural mandate, and I'm comfortable with that because I think this involves culture. As man rules and subdues his environment, that involves the animal kingdom. It involves agriculture. It involves architecture. It involves music and art and all those sorts of things. Yes? Is, is this what covenantal guys call the covenant of works? Um, for them, covenant of works would be more Genesis 2, 15 to 17 with the test, of the, the obedience, disobedience thing in regard, in, in, they usually ca call this, and I would say rightly so at this point, the, uh, the cultural mandate. I would broaden it out here. I, I, I would totally agree with them. This, this includes culture. This includes man interacting with this beautiful world and environment and doing what God wants him to do. Um, but I think it's, I, th I think because I see kingdom as the theme of scripture, I, I tend to view this more as the uh, man's role within the kingdom program. So it's very important to understand, uh, obviously from, you know, from Genesis 1 and 2, particularly Genesis 1.31, that the world God created was very good. So that automatically makes us different from the, from the Hindus and the Buddhists and the Platonists and the Gnostics and all these different groups that like to denigrate the physical realm. God cares about the physical world. Uh, the material and the immaterial realm um, are important to him. So he doesn't create man. Because you have to remember... Uh, you know, we talk more about this in Theo 4, but there's a kind of a spiritual vision model approach that kind of views man's destiny as sitting on a cloud with a harp doing nothing all day or just singing hymns all day. Um, that's not man's destiny from the beginning, nor is it in the future. Um, so this is, this is very, it's very earth oriented. God is capital K king. He's the creator. Man is image of God as a small K king to represent God, to rule and subdue the earth for God's glory. That, that's his task. So now on the, at the end of this last point, I also include that he is also created to be in three relationships with God, other people, and creation. I would just say by the very fact that he's created by God, 
um, there's a creator creature relationship. And if you read Romans one, you'll see the problem with the problem with sinful man is they're not giving the creator glory. They're not they're 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 doing things for themselves sinfully and suppressing the truth. So. Uh, Man is immediately put into a relationship with God. Um, he's also put into a relationship with other people because he, you know, as we, and, and obviously Genesis 2 will flesh this out more of what that means in regard to the first man and the first woman with Adam and Eve. And then, but, but the very fact that we're talking about here, the uh, filling of the earth, that also is going to include children. So obviously man has a uh, vertical relationship with God and also a horizontal relationship with man, but he's also put in charge of the earth, which means he does have a relationship to the creation. So I guess there's a sense in which man is, uh, when it comes to relationships, he's looking up, he's looking vertical, horizontal with other human beings and down in the sense of he's uh, uh, to be ruling and subduing the creation that God gave him. And I would say that he was created in a re right relationship with all three of those. Okay, so that's the first part of the story. That's a very significant thing to understand is that there is a, there is a charter, there's a mandate, there is a, this is what man is supposed to do. And obviously it's centered in his right, it, it's, there's the assumption there that as a creature, he's doing this to honor the creator. This isn't just for his own, just to do it for his own uh, desires without relationship to God. Okay, now that brings you to the second, the second step, which would be, Man disobeys God and fails the kingdom mandate to rule and subdue the creation. So, so he, you know, he fails. I mean, he's, he, decide, he decides to do what he wants to do. Obviously, that's through you know, Eve, what Eve did and then with the federal head, Adam. So he disobeys God. Let's just put it that once he disobeys, the kingdom mandate can't be filled, fulfilled as God wants it. It does not do away with the kingdom mandate. Because I'll just, just speak for myself. I think kind of it, my general impressions when I first became a believer in my middle teenage years was that, you know, I'd read this passage and go, oh yeah, you know, man was supposed to rule and subdue the earth. But once we get saved, our destiny is to f fly away to heaven and live there forever, to live up, you know, in an immaterial realm. And I think the thing that we're going to see is that man can't fulfill this task anymore, but Hebrews 8, I'm sorry, Psalm 8 and Hebrews 2 will tell us that this has never been forfeited. This is still expected. It's just man can't do it right. And the creation is going to work against him. So he fails the kingdom mandate to rule and subdue the creation. And it also affects the three relationships that he was placed in. He becomes spiritually dead to God. I mean, he's, you know, spiritual death takes place. There's separation. Uh, God promised them uh, you know, in Genesis 2, 15 to 17, that if they obeyed, they would surely die. Uh, obviously, there was a, the, the, their relationship with God is severed at that point spiritually. They're sinners at that point. Um, because God has a salvation plan, he doesn't physically execute them at that point. That's where Genesis 3, 15 comes into play. But the process of death is in motion. And then, you know, they, they do in human, humankind, uh, all humans will end up dying. So, the three relationships suffer. The uh, man's relationship to God suffers. Person to person relationships suffer. You know, you can get it, we can get a little bit of discussion. We'll do that later about the you know uh, you know he will um, you know your desire will be for him, but he will rule over you. We can discuss whether that's physical desire. I actually lean more towards it being indicating more of tension within the relationship. Um, for sure, when you get to the when you get to Cain and Abel, you see that that you know that the first bro when you're dealing with the first brothers one of them becomes a murderer and so obviously mankind's relationship with each other has been filled with uh murders and you know strain ever since the fall and obviously with the creation i mean you read genesis 3 and you'll see that the uh, the ground is cursed because of what man has done man was supposed to rule over it but now it's going to work against him so all three of those relationships were hurt Okay, so the fall helps explain why things went badly. Number three, the third point on here, uh, God promises a coming seed of the woman, a man who will destroy Satan and reverse the curse. So that's why Genesis 3 is so important. I do believe it is a proto-evangelium. I do believe it's a first gospel because I think this has to be beyond more than just, just a physical snake. 
I think it's talking about the cosmic battle. Satan was the power behind the serpent. Oh, and if you notice in Genesis 3.15, as God speaks to the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. You shall bruise him on the heel. So notice there's a battle between your seed and her seed, um, which indicates, you know, which is going to culminate in a certain he. Again, when you're dealing with the uh, seed concept in the Old and the New Testament, there can be a, a, a one and a many aspect to it. Um, ob- obviously, I would see that the, the he shall bruise you on the head as ultimately being fulfilled with Christ. You shall bruise him on the heel. You know, there he also strikes a blow at the, at the, uh, at the, at the Savior. Um, but, he's, uh, but, the, but the power behind the serpent is ultimately going to be cursed. I think this is the beginning of the seed line promise. We'll get more into that later, but you'll, you'll see the seed line become more specific as time moves on. Start with Adam, start with Noah, you get to Shem, gets to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then David, and eventually it ends up in Christ. Galatians 3.16 refers to Jesus as the ultimate seed, ultimate seed of Abraham. So I guess what's important to understand here is that there is a seed of the woman who's going to defeat the power behind the serpent. So in other words, there's going to be a man. I mean, there's going to be a man who's going to, I like to call this to reverse the curse and restore all things. So God's, God tasked man to rule and subdue the earth. He has failed and yet there's hope. That's what come Genesis 3.15 is so beautiful because in this, uh, from our perspective, awful, cha- awful consequences described in this chapter, there's hope that's given and there's the promise here. There's going to be someone come from the, from the seed of the woman, from the line of the woman, who is, gonna, who is going to bruise the head and defeat uh, the power behind the serpent. So that's an important thing to understand here is there, need, there needs to be, in the realm of the mediatorial kingdom and what's going on on earth, victory over uh, um, the, the powers of darkness. Okay, that leads us to our point number four, which is that, you know, this probably could be a subset of three, but I, I separated here. The people of God anticipate this coming man who will be a savior. So, you know, if, if you look in uh, Genesis 4.1, not everybody agrees with this understanding, but it seems like th- there's becoming more and more of an acceptance of this view. Uh, Walter Kaiser holds this view. Um, I think uh, Gentry from Southern and his Kingdom Through Covenant view has promoted this view. It's become more popular. Uh, the belief that there's the real possibility that Eve may have thought that Cain was going to be the deliverer. Uh, now the man had relations with his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to Cain and she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Some, will just, some just believe that that should be translated. You know, I have, you know, I have, I have, I've gotten a, a, ch- a child, even the Lord. You know, some believe that Eve is making a declaration that this, this may be the fulfillment of the Genesis 3.15. Like I said, not, not everybody agrees on that, but I think that is very possible. I also think it's interesting in Genesis 5.28 to 29 that Noah's father thought he might be the one who would reverse the curse. Genesis 5.28 to 29, Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah saying, this one shall give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. So there's the possibility there that there was the, you know, the expectation that uh, Noah may be the one to reverse the curse. So like I said, the, not everybody agrees on those understanding, but you know, if you put Genesis 4.1 with Genesis 5.28 to 29, it seems to indicate to me that there could be, that, that there is an expectation of a coming one. And, and by the way, I'm a huge proponent of there being a messianic hope in the Old Testament. I really believe that there was the expectation of a coming one, a seed of the woman, a specific individual, not just a corporate idea, but a specific individual. And if that is the case, then there's not only is there the promise of a one to defeat the power behind the serpent, but there's the expectation in the people of God that there's this coming man who will do this? Yeah. Is seed of the woman, the seed is normally associated with the man. With the man, right? Right. Um, do, do you think that then is and from this point on you'll see that? Right. Go ahead. It, it, I'm interested to know if you think that that may refer to the virgin birth, or since it says seed of the woman, it's just unusual to say seed of the woman. Yeah, some people do. The, I mean, I think in a sense. 
I, I think with that, because, uh, because you're dealing with, I think seed has the corporate and the individual sense. So, I, and I think both are there. I mean, I, 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 so I, I'm seeing, in Genesis 3, 15, I'm seeing, I'm, seeing cor- I'm seeing corporate and individuals, a seed line that ends up in the ultimate, ultimate seed. Um, I probably have to do a little bit more thinking to come to a hard and fast conclusion on whether it's specifically referring to the, I mean, that, that it could have, I mean, I obviously think it has implications for it. Do I think that that's, speci- that's it, it's only that specifically that it's referring to? I would say no, because I think there's that corporate aspect to it. I would say that it's related to it, but it's not just that. Any other questions at this point? Okay, so that brings us to number five. And this takes us to Psalm 8. So if you jump over to Psalm 8. What's interesting about this is the, I like to call Psalm 8, four to eight, basically the commentary on Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And I'll just go ahead and read, you know, point five is this. Man's right to rule and subdue the earth is affirmed even in a fallen world. So if you look at Psalm 8, four, Psalm of David, David says, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God. You crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. Isn't that interesting? The language, this word there, you crown him with glory and majesty. That's kingly talk, right? Verse six, you, you make him to rule over the works of your hands. So that again emphasizes that man is an image bearer, is a king. He's a small K king, but he's God's, he's supposed to be God's man and he's to rule over the works of your hands. The end of verse six says, you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. So yeah, I mean, that sounds a lot like Genesis one. I mean, the creation, all these certain sorts of things, man's created with glory and majesty. He's to rule. Again, uh, the rule term being a very, uh, very kingly. Then you get the subjects of it, the sheep and the oxen, oxen, the beasts, the birds of the heavens, the fish, you know, all those sorts of things. So when I read Psalm 8, what that indicates to me is Genesis 1, 26 to 28 has never been revoked. So like I said, it's not the case. Before the fall, it's the earth. After the fall, our destiny is just to, uh, to fly away someday and to have nothing to do with the earth ever again. It's not the case. So remember, point one, we're talking about the kingdom mandate of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Point two, that's the fall. Man disobeys God, fails the kingdom mandate, and is you know, separated from God spiritually. Number three, you have the promise of, this, of, the, of a coming seed of the woman who will destroy the power behind the serpent and reverse the curse. Four, the people of God anticipate the coming man who will be a savior. Five, man's right to rule and subdue the earth is affirmed even in a fallen world. So that's where we stand right now as this is progressing. Point six, this brings you to the New Testament and uh, what Jesus means. And again, there's, I mean, there's a, obviously, a, I mean, Jesus is going to be what brings completion to everything that's talked about in the Old Testament. So we're not covering every every area of doctrine that could be here. There's all kinds of soteriological implications we're not getting into this point. But uh, Jesus is many things. He's the ultimate seed of Abraham. Uh, he's the ultimate David. But one of the things that we know about Jesus too, according to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I think verse 45, he's referred to as the last Adam. There's a connection between Adam if you look at, I think, with Matthew's genealogy, you know, he's referred to as the son of David and the son of Abraham. Luke's genealogy links him, you know, with Adam, which obviously is the case for all of us. But the, uh, so Jesus is many things. I'm emphasizing here more, more in regard to his uh, direct connection with being uh, the last Adam. And by being the last Adam, there's federal headship implications with that in the sense of the one acting on behalf of the many. But Jesus as the ultimate man and last Adam gives samples of dominion over the earth with his first coming. 
And so now when you get into this whole issue of the purpose of Jesus's miracles, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty disputed. The uh, kind of the common view, very, very common today in theological circles is that Jesus's miracles meant the inauguration of the Davidic kingdom, which I don't believe that. I, don't, I mean, I get more into that in the Theo 4. Um, what I do believe, I do believe they are related to the kingdom in the sense that he is giving demonstrations of the kingdom in his person and work. But we also know that there's two comings of the Messiah. We also know that he's rejected. He came unto his own and his own received him not. And thus he is fulfilling the promise of Psalm 110.1, that there needs to be a session of the, of the Messiah at the right hand of the Father until he begins his reign from Jerusalem. <laughs> Uh, Hebrews 10, 12 to 13 says he's at the right hand waiting from that time onward until you know, he begins to rule over his enemies. So my understanding of the miracles of Jesus is that they are, they are demonst- they're really demonstrations of what the millennium is going to look like on a big scale. And by the millennium, I am referring to a future coming millennium. Um, so when Jesus, y- you have to remember... Uh, when we're taught, when Jesus does a healing miracle, that's really a demonstration of Isaiah 35, which promised that people were going to be healed in Messiah's kingdom. You know, the lame are going to walk. You know, those that are sick are going to be healed. When Jesus does a healing miracle, that's a demonstration of widespread healing in the kingdom. When Jesus raises somebody from the dead, that is a demonstration of the resurrection to life. That's going to take place on a grand scale when he comes again. Uh, When Jesus does nature miracles, when he's walking on waters or making donkeys appear in places that they're, you wouldn't think that they would be or would would seem to, you know, those those sorts of, when he does nature miracles, when he multiplies food, all those sorts of things are showing his mastery over nature. You have to remember that the restoration of all things in the kingdom obviously includes people being in a right relationship with God, but it also involves the creation. So he's, he's doing those things. Um, he's giving demonstrations uh, of that. So uh, the healing ministry, the resurrection ministry, the nature miracles, they're all glimpses of what it's going to be like in the kingdom. Like I said, if, if you read Isaiah 11, it talks about animal harmony in the kingdom. When you read Isaiah 35, it's talking about physical miracles. When you read Isaiah 65, you know, it's talking about agriculture and those sorts of things. So there, there is that... Uh, Relationship, and by the way, I do. I, to me, when it comes to the miracles of Jesus, they have multiple purposes. I'm not just saying it's just that. I mean, obviously, they're acts of compassion. He's showing evidence of who he is. So there's multiple purposes, but they are. They also are demonstrations of uh, what of of the kingdom and the restoration of all things. Next step here would be number seven that the writer of Hebrews affirms man's right to rule the world but affirms that this does not happen yet. So if you look at Hebrews 2, you know, you're getting the superiority of Christ in the first couple chapters of Hebrews. Um, And if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, for he, God, did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. So it's important to understand here that, you know, you know, uh, Hebrews has a lot more eschatology in it than a lot of people think. You know, here we're talking about the world to come. You know, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, it says we're seeking the city which is to come. So although there is a lot of already eschatology in, or, or some already in Hebrews, there's also some futuristic eschatology. But he, he's talking about the world to come. It's not subject to angels, we're told in verse 5, but according to Hebrews 2, 6, but one has testified somewhere saying, and what you have here is a quote from Psalm 8. Now remember, Psalm 8 is a commentary on Genesis 1, 26 to 28. But here's the quote. What is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So now what's interesting about that is that again is another affirmation of the kingdom mandate of Genesis 1. Um, so notice again here, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, Psalm 8, Hebrews 2. We're still seeing 
that God is concerned about man's relationship to the world, in this particular case, the world to come, which is involving Messiah's kingdom. <clears throat> now, notice at the end, you know, it, it, when you come after the quote in verse 8, it says, for in subjecting all things to him, and again, at this particular point, it's talking about man. Now, when you get to 1 Corinthians 15, we'll see that Psalm 8 has specific reference to the federal head of man, which is Jesus. But at this particular point, it's still referring to man collectively. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. So in other words, even in a fallen world, the world's still, still supposed to be fought, ruled over by man. But notice the next part of the verse. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. So in other words, it's still not fixed yet. That's what come we have the world to come. That's what come we have the city to come. And that's come, just to give a little footnote to that, that's what come I think we have to have a proper understanding of what's fulfilled at the first coming of Christ and what's fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. There are certain things fulfilled at this first coming. We can call those already fulfillments. There are still things that need to be fulfilled at a second coming. Those are, you know, second, those are not yet fulfillments. So, uh, so sometimes when I think people make errors and they're looking at the big picture of theology, they either overemphasize fulfillment with Christ's first coming and don't do very, have very little for the second coming, or they see very little fulfillment with Christ's first coming and perhaps overdue fulfillment that needs to be done at the second coming. We need to make sure uh, that we have the proper balance on that. I guess what I would see is I would see that the... Uh, Obviously, the suffering servant ministry of Christ fulfillment is emphasized with his first coming. Um, if you look at Acts 3, I think Acts 3 actually gives the perfect balance to this. This is the perfect already not yet. By the way, when I use already not yet, I'm not being Laddian. Um, a lot of the time, by George, you know, George Ladd's kind of, uh, not that he's the one that invented the concept, but the... Uh, that the Davidic kingdom is already, but then it's also not yet. I'm not talking about Davidic kingdom already, not yet. I'm talking about God's purposes broadly. There's certain things fulfilled. If you look at uh, Acts 3.18, as Peter is addressing the men of Israel, according to verse 12, <clears throat> we're told in verse 18, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So when it comes to suffering servant, Isaiah 53, th that's been fulfilled. I mean, that's already, I mean, there is already eschatology. The Old Testament promised a suffering servant to die a, a substitutionary death. That has been fulfilled. And notice it's, that's been fulfilled, that which was talked about by the mouth of all the prophets. That has been fulfilled. Now look at verses 19 and following. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, that's the second coming, whom heaven must receive until the period of the restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Now isn't it interesting? He again appeals to the Old Testament, but he says that still needs to come. That still needs to happen. That's still in the future. So... So as we come back to the, uh, you know, what we're talking about in Hebrews chapter 2, um, verse 8, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. That's not yet. In other words, the, I think we can say that the rule and subdue the earth mandate, which still belongs to man, it's not, it's not being fulfilled as it's supposed to be today. Um, because of Jesus, the ultimate man, Adam, last Adam, it is going to be fulfilled. And that's going to lead us to what we're going to talk about next point, which is point eight. Jesus, the ultimate man, and last Adam, returns to earth and binds Satan and reigns over all in the millennial kingdom and fulfills the rule and subdue mandate. And so that's where we believe that this, the doctrine of man, will intersect with the millennial kingdom here. Um, um, I know this is a little bit of eschatology here, but remember, if you're premillennial, you see a future earthly kingdom that is an earthly kingdom, okay? Um, if you're not premillennial, you have Christ messianic millennial kingdom taking place in heaven today. You have the reign of the saints being their intermediate state in heaven today, 
or regeneration. There's different views among those who are non-premillennial in that view. The, let me just put it this way. The, the reign of the last Adam is an earthly reign. Of course, there's a heavenly session of Christ right now at the right hand of the Father. But to put it this way, Jesus needs to rule from and over the realm that the, that the first Adam failed. And so that has not occurred yet, but that will occur in the millennial kingdom. And thus, I would take you to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. <clears throat> now, I, I know this is another issue more for 304. I, I do think that Paul's talking about three stages of the resurrection program. He's giving an order. Christ the first fruits, then those are his that is coming, then comes the end. I think the end is after the millennial kingdom. He's giving an order of things. Usually an order doesn't just include two things. It's usually a progression of things. I think the order here is a reference to the millennial kingdom. But it does say in verse 24, then comes the end when he, notice, hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power for he must reign. Notice the word must. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now it's very interesting about this passage here is it's talking about Jesus handing the kingdom over to the Father. And that's the eternal state. So what's interesting here is it, it indicates that there, has, there must be a successful reign before the transition over to the eternal state. And what I would say, part, I think part of the reason why that has to be the case is, is remember, there's always been a universal kingdom of God. That's always existed in eternity. But when God created the world, he tasked man to do it right. So the, and that's who Jesus ends up being. Ends up being, of course, he's God, son of God, but he also ends up being the last Adam. He ends up being the ultimate David. He's the Messiah. When he talks about that he must reign, I think that's an indicator that there has to be a mediatorial vice regent rule upon the earth before the transition to the eternal state. And then notice verse 26, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now notice in verse 27, notice the Old Testament quote. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. That's a quote from Psalm 8.6. So notice the connections here. Genesis 1.26-28. Psalm 8.4-8. Hebrews 2.5-8. Now we're looking at 1 Corinthians 15. Now a good question might be here is, well wait a minute. Psalm 8 was referring to man collectively as having the right to rule the earth, Right? Uh, when you get to Hebrews 8, it seems to be still be broader. You know, to man, it's been you know, subjected to rule over the earth. Now we see this Psalm 8 quote in specifically in regard to Jesus. This is an individual here that we're talking about. So what is it? Is it collective or is it individual? And I'm going to say it's both because that's what federal headship is about. <laughs> you end up having the one that can represent the many. So what I guess what I'm arguing here is that since the fall, no man is able to fulfill the kingdom mandate, right? Because men are sinners. But there ends up being the ultimate man in verse 45 of this chapter. He's, Jesus is referred to as the last Adam. He is the one that does it. So he's the ultimate seed. He's the ultimate son of David. He's the ultimate Adam. So I guess what we're saying here is that when it comes to the fulfillment of the Genesis 1, 26 to 28 mandate, of which Psalm 8 affirms, it ends up being linked to Jesus. So that, that's what's key here. And notice he must reign until all his enemies have been put under his feet. Uh, the end of verse 27 says, all things are put in subjection. It is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. Notice verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, to Jesus, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all. So do you see a transition that's taking place here? You know, Jesus has to reign, and I would say reign over the earth, and when that's done successfully, he hands the kingdom over to God the Father. And that particular point, I think you'd see, a, in a sense, the mediatorial kingdom merging into the universal kingdom at that point. I guess if, I was to, if, if we're connecting the dots here, you know, we're going to say Genesis 1, 26 to 28, 
It's the, it's the mandate to man. And then we go over to Psalm 8. Mandate affirmed. Then we go to Hebrews 2, 5 to 8. Mandate affirmed. And we're still seeing fulfillment future. Now we come over to 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28, and we're seeing mandate to be fulfilled in Jesus. Who is ultimate man. So when Jesus fulfills it, he fulfills the mandate. We'll get here shortly too that as he does that, that also involves those who identify with him. So there's going to be that corporate aspect as well. I would just say, you know, after teaching the New Testament use of the Old Testament class this summer, I think there's, there's, there's two, there's the, the, co the concept of corporate solidarity and federal headship is like key to understanding God. It's not the only key, but it's one of the keys to understanding God's purpose. This concept of the one representing the many. So just like with the seed concept, is the seed many or is it one? Well, it has implications for both. So in this particular case, it's broad, 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 and then it narrows into Jesus. But as it narrows into Jesus, it'll go broad again <laughs> because everybody who identifies with him gets to participate in that reign. So the th I guess the thing that you should get from uh, this point eight at this particular point is that Jesus's return, and I'm not even going to Revelation 20 at this point. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that you have a reign of the Messiah following the second coming if the chronology of Revelation 19 to 20 uh, follows, which I think it does. Okay, now this brings us to point number nine. Okay, so we've understood Jesus is the one who fulfills the mandate of man. Those who identify with Jesus also rule and reign in the millennial kingdom as a result of their identification with the last Adam. The federal head of mankind allows other men to succeed with him. So this is where you're going to end up getting, although this doesn't specifically refer to Genesis 1, 26, 28, it has, you know, uh, it has implications for it. Revelation 5, 10, Revelation 20, 4 to 5. Um, if you look at, uh, if you go to Revelation 5, 10, there's this scene in heaven. It's a heavenly scene. It's in the universal kingdom of God up in heaven. You have the Father on the throne. You have the Lamb who is worthy. He takes the scrolls out of the, out of the, out of the hand of, uh, of, of, the, of the one on the throne. Now, and then you have this song in heaven. And it says in Revelation 5.10, You have made them, and, this is, and the them is referring to people that were purchased by the blood of Christ, people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And then in verse 10, it tells us, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Notice that. Those that have been saved, they, they belong to Christ. They're positionally a kingdom. It's looking forward to their reign upon the earth. And this ties in closely with that concept that when when the Messiah reigns, those who are identified with him, they also reign. So not only does there need to be a reign of the Messiah and the last Adam in the realm that the first Adam failed, there also needs to be a reign of those who identify with the Messiah in that realm. So, um, and by the way, I would, as you're looking at that Revelation 5.10, you would closely want to connect Daniel 7 with that. If you look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, uh, it's talking about, you know, what I would consider to be the, 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 the tribulation period coming up. If you notice in Daniel 7, 13, it says, I kept looking in the night visions and behold with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. He came up to the ancient of days, was presented before him and to him was given dominion, glory and a kingdom. 
And then at the end of verse 14, it says, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. So the son of man gets a kingdom, right? Now, if you notice when you, when you jump down in Daniel chapter 7, it talks about the, this little horn who's persecuting the saints of God. You know, I would believe that to be the Antichrist. You know, verse 21 says, I kept looking and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. Now what's important about that is these saints are being persecuted on the earth. But then God flips it. The Ancient of Days comes along, judgment is passed, and guess what? The saints took possession of the kingdom. They take possession in the realm where their persecution was taking place. And then if you look down at verse 27, or verse 26 and 27, it says, the court will sit for judgment. His dominion of the Antichrist will be taken away, annihilated and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. So this is kind of like the picture I see is like the saints of God, they're persecuted in this world that we live in. You know, in this world, you shall have persecution and trial, right? But there comes a point where their situation is flipped. Evil is defeated, and you see that they take possession of the kingdom. So not only does Jesus need to rule in the realm that the last Adam failed, and also the realm where he was rejected at his first coming, so too must those who belong to him. The saints of God are persecuted in this realm. They too are going to be granted a kingdom in this, in this realm as well. So, and of course I would tell you, uh, if you look at Revelation, if you come to Revelation, I'm actually going to have you stop at Revelation 6, 9 to 11. And then we're going to go to Revelation 24 to 5. In Revelation 6, 9, you see that these, there are people, and I would say it's during the tribulation period, but these are people killed because of their testimony for Christ. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. So these are people that died for the sake of Christ. Their souls are up in heaven. I mean, their bodies are on the, in the ground decaying at that point, looking forward to resurrection. Their souls are up in heaven. They say in verse 10, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And isn't that interesting? When they get up to heaven, they're not reigning in a kingdom at this point. They're, they're wanting vengeance in the realm where their death occurred. So one thing I think is interesting about this is, not, like, don't get me wrong, I mean, I affirm all the... Uh, to go and be with Christ is far better, that you know the, the pains and sufferings of this life are all gone. But I find it interesting that these saints who end up in heaven, what's, what do they want to do? They want to get back down to the earth with Christ's kingdom. <laughs> so it's kind of like, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood you know, in the realm of the earth? And then if you read verse 11, they were given a white robe and they were told that they should wait a little while longer. In other words, you, you guys just hold on here. I mean, it's playing out. So your frustration, your frustration will be uh, soothed or alleviated, and you want to know where it's where it's alleviated? It's it's uh, it's soothed in Revelation 20 verses 4 to 5. Revelation 19 discusses the second coming. Revelation 21 to 3 discusses the binding of Satan. Remember, Satan's the power behind the serpent. So you see Satan dealt with, and then in Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. We're told, then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So Revelation 24 to 5 is the answer to the Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Remember, Revelation 6, saints of God on the earth, persecuted, killed. Their souls end up in heaven. How long, O Lord, until you, you know, avenge our blood upon the earth? Revelation 20 occurs. Second coming comes. Satan is bound. They're reigning. They're given thrones. They come to life. That's a physical resurrection. 
This is not just a statement of regeneration or spiritual resurrection. These are people that were killed physically in Revelation 6, 9 to 11. They're now giving a, they're given a resurrected body and they reign with Christ for a thousand years on the earth. Because remember, always connect Revelation 24 to 5 with Revelation 5, 10. They will reign upon the earth. Here, they're resurrected. They're, they're given thrones and they come to life and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. So... What I'm getting at here with, with this verse 9 is not only does, is Jesus the ultimate man who fulfills the mandate, but you see that those who, in other words, the saints, reign too. They reign with Jesus. Those who identify with Jesus also get to partake in the Genesis 1, 26 to 28 mandate. So it's kind of like a both and. It happens because of Jesus, but those who identify with their federal head Jesus, they participate in the reign as well. So it is, again, it's kind of that both and situation. So those who belong to him participate in that reign, which Revelation 5.10 tells us is upon the earth. Yes? I'm just kind of thinking about uh, communion as you're talking about yeah. identifying with Christ. Yeah. Um, how do you think that relates to that in like 1 Corinthians 11 or just in communion in general? I mean, maybe I'm not asking a specific enough question. As far as the concept of identification? Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to think how that, how does that tie? Because now we don't, we're not fully, um, we're not dead yet. We're not with him yeah. yet. But how does it last while we're on, in this earth? Well, we have union with Christ and all but the New Testament would say that that includes. I mean, I, I would say the main aspect of the union with Christ is the, uh, the new covenant. I, and I do believe there's an already aspect of the new covenant. Indwelling spirit, forgiveness of sins, a new heart. All those sorts that we have, you know, and, and you know, uh, the Holy Spirit, Christ, you know, li you know, living within us. So in that in that sense, there's that. And again, we 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 keep the Lord. We we proclaim that until He comes. So even as we do that, it's present, but it's also forward looking. Um, what's interesting about that? Well, uh, in 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 Luke 22, when Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, He says, "I'm not going to eat of the fruit of the vine again with you until we do it in the kingdom." So he has a physical meal with them, and then he says, we're not going to do this again until. But there needs to be the, re the remembrance of that pointing towards it. So even in the Last Supper, there's a lot of eschatological implications. Okay. All right. Now this brings to point 10, and then we can op open it up for some questions or discussions on this. But uh, Now again here, I'm, I'm really playing closely off the truths of 1 Corinthians 15. I, you, you really need to grasp that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 to 28, that there is a transition. <clears throat> Remember, we're told that in verse 24, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God and the Father. So there is there has to be some sense in which Jesus hands the kingdom over to the Father. Okay? It's when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. It's almost, not almost, that Paul is saying here is there must be a successful reign of Jesus before the transition to the eternal state. That doesn't mean Jesus stops to rule because we know that, you know, he rules forever. If you read Revelation 22, the first few verses, he's on the throne with the Father. But there's something specific about this mediatorial kingdom rule that has to happen before the eternal state can begin. And again, remember verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all. So this leads me to my point 10 here. This is the uh, uh, Genesis, or I'm sorry, point one is the uh, once upon a time, this is they lived happily ever after. Because this is one, once, once this mandate is per perfectly fulfilled, it rolls into the eternal state. So when, when the mandate to multiply, rule, and subdue are completely fulfilled by Jesus and the saints in the millennium, the kingdom then transfers to the Father's kingdom of the eternal state. Mission accomplished! Exclamation point. As a result of the ultimate man, Jesus, the earth has been successfully ruled and subdued, Satan has been defeated, and the curse has been forever removed. And then we could even add too, everybody's been healed, you know, believers, resurrected, healed, restored, nature's in harmony, all that sort of stuff. Just think about it, everything that went badly in Genesis 3 is restored and more at this particular point. And also, last point, 
Man is in proper relationship with the three relationships, God, other people, and creation, and it's done perfectly. Man's task is a success because of Jesus, the ultimate man. So, so it ends up being those. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying here is the, the, I think this is the connection of man from Genesis 1 through the end of the eternal state. And I probably should have included one more verse, but if you, if you look at Revelation 22, verse 5, this truly is the ultimate, they lived happy, happily ever after verse. Because if you look at the very last verse that describes the eternal, the eternal state, because you have to remember is verse 5, Revelation 22, 5. Because when you hit 6, it's epilogue. So remember, there's a lot of stuff to come after verse 5, but it's epilogue. So here's the last statement Revelation 22, 5. There will no longer be any night. They will not have need of the, of, a, of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. Isn't that interesting? Genesis 20, what, what was the command here? It was to rule. It was to rule. And what do we get when we get very, to the end here with Revelation 22, 5? We're seeing that the people of God they reign forever and ever. What ends up happening between here and here ends up being the successful completion of that mediatorial rule that then transitions into the perfect eternal, eternal state. So this is partly why I, to me, the whole issue of the millennium, it's not just a little academic thing that we kind of like to debate here and there and Okay, I say it's here, I say it's there. I mean, it, a pre, premillennialism is actually a major aspect of the Bible storyline. It's a, and I would say anthropology is part of the, a large reason why it would be premillennial. I may seem kind of weird, because um, yes, millennium is just supposed to be an eschatology topic, but it's very closely related to, uh, one of my problems with non-premillennial doctrine is it has, the, 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 the messianic millennial reign of the Messiah and the saints taking place in heaven. And you have ISIS and all these nations doing their thing, not acknowledging that, doing their own thing. That's not Messiah's kingdom. When Messiah's kingdom is established, Zechariah 14 tells us, his name will be the only one. That, ha that has to happen, Revelation 5.10, upon the earth. Okay, that's the jet tour. That's the jet tour of the, uh, go ahead. In Revelation 6, the saints who are seeking to be back on earth to, av to avenge, are they saints that were only persecuted in the tribulation? Or is that, when you say saints, that includes persecuted pre before the trib and during the trib? Um, I think that because Revelation, uh, in other words, I do think Revelation 6, let me just put it the way, it's particularly about them. I think there's application for saints of all ages, to be honest. Um, so in other words, the, those are those who are persecuted in the tribulation um, based on other passages, which Revelation 2, 26 to 27 promises that the church will reign in the millennium. Uh, Old Testament passages like Daniel 7, promise that Old Testament saints will also rule. I think it ends up being, it doesn't exclude the other, but it's primarily about them. And it may be possible when you're looking at Revelation 20, th th there's debate on this. So it's hard to be dogmatic. It seems like in verse four of Revelation 20 that there's a, there's a broader statement here. Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, which is talking about the Revelation 6 tribulation martyrs. There's debate as to whether the second group is just an explanation of the first group or if the first group is broader. I'm not dogmatic on that, but I think the first group is broader. Because like, you know, it may be helpful to look at the Revelation 2, 26 to 27 passage, but you know, I, I would definitely see this including the, ra the raptured church being a part of the... Uh, the rain as well, because it says in Revelation 2, 26 to 27, he shall rule, um, he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces as I also have received authority from my father. That's, that's a promise to the church that they're gonna be reigning over the nations too. So they're gonna be, they're gonna be a part of it.
as well. And of course, Daniel 7.27 told us that the Old Testament saints will be have the kingdom as well. All right, any other thoughts or questions? Yep. Can you explain again the, the concept behind federal, federal headship of Eden, Adam, and Christ? Okay. Yeah, all right. Um, uh, the question has to deal with the whole issue of, of what federal headship is and its implications. When you're dealing with federal headship, you're, you're dealing with the one who represents the many. Romans 5, particularly verses 12 to 21, make a strong implication that what Adam, when Adam sinned, we sinned. Now, there's some debate as to how exactly, what the, exactly that means. Adam sinned, we, we sinned. Um, when you read the rest of the Romans 5, Christ does one act with implications for, for others. So a federal head does things that impacts others. It's just like if the, uh, for those who are citizens of the United States, if, if the president declares war, guess what? You're at war. You know what I mean? The, 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 other, the, the enemy doesn't say, you know, that, that's Bill Thompson down there. He's not for the war. We're, we're going we're to pass over him. You know what I mean? It's just like everybody, the United States is at war. Um, a father makes a decision on behalf of a family. It's the whole. So the, that's what we're talking about there. So the, uh, if you read uh, both Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, being up Christ and Adam as doing things that impact humanity. So, and you know, and of course, Romans 5 goes through the 12 to 21, goes to the, all the bad things Adam did for us and all the good things that Jesus brings to those who are his. Does that help? Yep. Yeah. The, the key thing that I'm emphasizing with the, with the federal, with the federal uh, headship view is the, key, the, the mandate, it's, I mean, when it's first given, it's given to Adam, right? But it's also given to mankind. Because when you hit Psalm 8, you know, it's being reiterated to mankind in general. And of course, when it ends up, Jesus ends up being the one who's the focal point of it, because he's the only one that can do it. Like I said, he gives glimpses of dominion over nature at his first coming, but establishes it at his second coming. And then those who are the saints, I probably should add the Daniel 7 to this as well, particularly verse 27. These indicate that the saints join the corporate federal head in the reign. So when you come to the end of the millennium, mission accomplished on, on, the, on the rule and subdue and fill mandate. And then you transition into the eternal state where it's, I, I, I would call it the, the merger between the uh, mediatorial kingdom and the universal kingdom. Because if you look at uh, Revelation 22, it says, uh, Revelation 22, 3 refers to the throne of God and of the Lamb. Remember in the millennium, the spotlight's on the Messiah. The, and in other words, he's God, he, he's the one like the trusted general under Caesar that puts down a rebellion and, and makes it what it's supposed to be. And then he comes back to Caesar and says, I've done it. Remember, he hands the kingdom back over to the Father. So Jesus' kingdom doesn't end, but it merges with the Father's universal kingdom at that point. Notice also, too, that you're seeing the doctrine of man intersecting with uh, crucial other doctrines at this point. You know, we're dealing with, uh, it intersects with Christology, it intersects with, the seed concept, it intersects with federal headship. It obviously intersects with the uh, whole issue of the fall. And again, a very important part of the, the whole issue of what is the millennial kingdom. Um, like I said, it's very cool today to not be premillennial or to act like it doesn't matter. It's actually a pretty important part of the Bible's storyline. So it's a, do you have to believe in the premillennialism? Of course not. I mean, it's, you don't have to be believe in that to be saved. But I think to understand the Bible storyline more accurately, I think you do need to grasp it. So it does intersect with uh, eschatology.